So yesterday, the UK Parliament uh, voted in favour of what's being kind of referred to as a generational smoking ban. So this is the idea that we might, or apparently will at the moment, introduce a sort of a new kind of smoking ban which hasn't been tried uh but hasn't actually been implemented anywhere uh in the world yet and the, the way that this law um is intended to work is that there will be set a date i think it is it's 2009 which will be which it will be decided will be the last year in which someone can be born and be able to buy um, cigarettes, tobacco. Tobacco, it is specifically tobacco, I think. Anyone born after that um, simply will never be able to. So at the moment, the smoking age, I don't think we, I don't think we, we refer to. Drinking is such a like inherent part of UK culture that, that we do refer to the drinking age. I don't think smoking is um, as much of a thing anymore to the point, I don't think we refer to it as the smoking age. Taking my kid down the corner shop to um, buy their first pack of cigarettes. The legal age at which you can um, legally buy cigarettes in the UK at the moment is 18. Previously it was um, 16 when I was at school, which is one of the really interesting things and maybe something we should bring into the discussion in a moment in terms of whether we think this is a good law or not, whether we think it is likely to be effective or not, um, is the extent to which the culture around smoking and tobacco use in the UK has changed. Um, when I was at secondary school, so when I was like a, a teenager, you could buy cigarettes from the shop at the age of 16. So we raised the smoking age to 18 back in 2007. I think 2006, the smoking ban came in. Scotland, it was introduced in 2006. And then in Wales, Northern Ireland and uh, England in 2007, restaurants, pubs, etc. could allow people to smoke indoors. Often you'd have, like in a restaurant, you might have a smoking area and a non-smoking area. Never with a particularly good, like, division between them. <laughs> this is probably the first, like, additional step onward from that previous uh, time. I can't think of another like big step in terms of trying to discourage smoking certainly not as big as this but as we discussed the big shift here is that rather than just being like 18 is the age and anyone who turns 18 can then go to their corner shop and buy cigarettes it's going to move so that anyone who is born after 2009 will just never be able to buy cigarettes it was something that was first floated in new zealand Ah, yeah, okay, so they voted through the law, but it never actually, they repealed it before it actually had a chance to um, come into effect. So it was the last Labour government, yeah, in New Zealand that introduced it, uh, under Jacinda Ardern, presumably, or at least under her um, successor, and then um, the Conservative Party, um, the National Party, sorry, in New Zealand, won uh, and, and became the new government and decided to um, roll it back. The kind of reason given for it was that they would prefer to have the tax income and people smoking and paying um, like pretty high taxes on uh, cigarettes than they would to just not have people smoking at all, which I don't know to what extent that is uh, the legitimate reason like i think there is that is often an argument that is given by libertarian leading think tanks and politicians and kind of media figures this idea that oh yeah smoking is bad it, you know it costs society money in terms of i don't know what the healthcare system Universal public system, apparently, which would make it very similar to the UK, which does tend to affect how um, governments set these kind of laws, right? Because public health then becomes more than just a matter of trying to keep people healthy. 
it also becomes a matter of are you spending money through the healthcare system on trying to fix problems or are you not in fact one of the like knock-on benefit effects of having like a publicly owned publicly funded healthcare system more broadly is that it pushes governments to do that kind of like public health work in the sense of avoiding people getting ill getting disease in the first place which ultimately across the last like however many hundreds of years has been the biggest factor in people living longer healthier lives right some of it is the fact that we have access to new treatments but a lot of it is that we were like oh we should like wash our hands and we should make sure that the water supply is separate to the um the sewage and we should you know we should do all these things to to stop people getting ill in the first place in the uk the nhs like quite early on like went all in on vaping like as a alternative to smoking right as a not not being like everyone gets stuck in but um the nhs like relatively quickly um began to promote using e-cigarettes as a smoking secession method right as a way of kind of kicking cigarettes a lot of british researchers have been really positive about them it was then really interesting reading american research and like some of the stuff done by national institutes for health and stuff in the us because they were a lot more cautious right that not that they not that they necessarily thought they were that e-cigarettes vapes were bad but that they were coming at it from more of a point of view of like okay let's like tread carefully here like let's think about those trade-offs between it, we accidentally make it cool again and like the young people who had stopped thinking smoking was cool and now vaping and such and like that's been really interesting because there's not those same knock-on effects right the nhs is looking at it and going oh actually there is also a a way in which we will relieve some pressure off the healthcare system uh as well i was chatting to someone who uh was running a campaign called uh energy for all which is a kind of campaign to kind of explore the idea of giving everyone in the uk or any other country uh, like a free energy allowance right so sort of like many of you all heard have heard of um proposals for a basic income right where everyone gets given like i was like fifteen thousand pounds a year or whatever as kind of replacement for social security programs like that and for kind of welfare programs like that the idea being that it reduces like it both reduces stigma but it also reduces uh, like the administration costs of the, the welfare state whilst also providing people with a really strong like safety net essentially and there's plenty of arguments kind of kind of for or against even within people who are generally pro um people not having to live in uh abject poverty right there's kind of all kinds of arguments about well do landlords would landlords just instantly put up all of the rent and supermarkets and like would the economy just absorb all that money or can we avoid that etc um and the energy for all campaign was essentially sort of saying well what if we did that but for energy right what if we we went okay everyone we sort of calculate a minimum amount of energy that people need for heat light cooking you know and a bit of entertainment i guess that, i guess that kind of covers the basics right well if we calculated that and say we're going to give everyone that for free um, if you want to use more electricity, more energy, you can, you're can. you more than welcome to pay for that and to do so. But we can stop, um, you know, we can make sure people aren't falling into food poverty. And I was like hosting a, a panel about this. And one of the people who was sort of proposing it was suggesting that um, as well as being a good thing in and of itself, it also has all these great, it, like the potential would be that it would have all these great knock-on effects, right? Because if the government is... Uh, you know through taxes like or sort of taking in potentially an extra bit of tax and then paying for um all this energy they would suddenly be so much more incentivized to go well let's make sure the houses are well insulated because then the energy is going to be cheaper let's make sure we've got big amounts of solar capacity so that we can um potentially just be generating that energy for a minimum minimal cost right and having a publicly owned, publicly run, publicly funded 
healthcare system often has the potential to, to, to do a very similar thing of going, you know, if the government's paying for, if the state is paying for healthcare, it is much more incentivized to do all of this public uh, health work, which is the kind of stuff which private companies just aren't in a place to do like it's really i guess like the the go-to example of like a really clear like public health project is like sexual health tracking right where if someone goes oh, i've got chlamydia or whatever there's a team in a in a local council or local healthcare kind of setting who will go right we we now need to go and we need to track down every person that they um they might have passed this on to um, so that we can kind of stop it going any further. Like, there's no real way of inserting a private company into that other than the council, the state, or whoever paying them to do that. And that stuff is really important, as we've just been discussing. So that potentially comes into uh, the decision to try and kick smoking out uh, for good, right? There are trade-offs, into, and one of the arguments for not further... Um, clamping down on smoking that is often given is this idea that what if we tax them to the extent that the NHS if in effect ends up making a profit even if they have to treat someone for a, an extended lung cancer case right and there's all kinds of trade-offs even in that right even you know talking in these horribly economic economicistically um ways about people's lives there's trade-offs right you also don't have to pay someone's pension if they um unfortunately pass away so yeah so all of that plays into this as well this smoking man's gonna be interesting i think um i don't know entirely where i sit on this i definitely see the argument that that we've made a huge amount of progress on this already is this rolling the dice for no um real reason i've also seen some kind of slightly more high-minded arguments about you know what does it mean for a country to have two different rules for like two different ages of adults and i don't i sort of don't mind that too much although i think that the, there is an interesting thing in terms of the kind of infantilization of young adults in the sense of like people who are like 18 to 30 that i do think is maybe interesting but but i don't feel like this is part of that but so it'll be interesting to see how it how it, it plays out. 